It is that time of year on the OHL podcast when Dan Mahar and I get to make absolute jackasses out of ourselves and we'll keep it on the record. You have it on the record. Once it's on the internet, it lives forever, right? And you can come back and you can mock every one of these predictions as we spend this week and next giving you our thoughts on how the conferences will end up because it's easy, right? Picking the exact finishing order of 10 teams per side. <laughs> now, even though before we get there, the Ontario Hockey League has interfered and given us some news to get to. So we're not trying to put off the inevitable humiliation. We will get to our Eastern Conference predictions in just a moment. However, I think the most important place to begin, Dan Mahar, is with that T-shirt you are wearing. I got to say, I'm not a fan of the hockey team, the pro hockey team that plays out of that city. I think you know that. But a Montreal Expos T-shirt is something to behold. Well done, sir. Well done. Thank you. Thank you for noticing. Yeah, well, as you know, I grew up a diehard Expos fan. I I just love the brand of baseball, love the team, was heartbroken when they left, but still, still trying to support the memories. And... You're doing it very well with uh, that logo on the T-shirt. Well done. If you're not on the YouTube channel, you better get on it because this is the kind of stuff that you miss, right? Mahar's wearing an Expos T-shirt, and I think I got some uh, fast pitch championship that was here in Kitchener some years ago on my golf shirt today. Uh, just before we get into the OHL news, I want to finish off some OHL podcast roll call. Welcome aboard Erie, rounding out the U.S. franchises. We talked about them last week. So the Otters now on board. Barry has jumped in. Two from Sudbury this week. So the Wolf Den is howling as we get underway. Sarnia and Windsor, we're going to give it to you, Carter. He says he lives in Michigan about an hour or so mm -hmm. from both. So he's representing both the Sting and the Spitfires franchises. Ottawa is here. Brantford and Brampton have all answered the OHL podcast roll call along with the Peets again, Saginaw. I, I can't keep up with all the Memorial cup champions fans that are here with us. Love to have you North Bay again, Flint again, Kitchener again, which means Dan, we have had roll call attendance has been answered by every team except the Sault St. Marie Greyhounds. What? And I say nice things about the Sioux. What what have I ever done to the northernmost outpost in the Ontario Hockey League? Come on with your coming on, Greyhounds fans. Let's go. <laughs> and I know we've had outreach from Sioux folks before. So let's just get on, in on this roll call, will you, Sue? Um, but I feel like we should sing the Star Spangled Banner or something, Mike. Like we had, uh, we had the, all the American franchises show up early. And we even have an American listener vouching for a Canadian team. So... Well, our American friends answer the roll call, roll call on spades. Absolutely. And anybody who ever asks, why does the Ontario Hockey League have three U.S.-based teams, two in Michigan and one in Pennsylvania? Because they love their puck there too, okay? And it's a great brand of hockey. So the fans in Erie, Flint, and Saginaw are obviously enjoying it. Maybe Dan the Sioux is a little bit late to jump in with us this season because there's a great deal of hand-wringing up in hounds nation right the top two picks not there in fact uh callum crossgree reported and, and committed to boston college and then just this week uh rider Callie is traded to the north bay battalion in return sue saint marie gets a sixth and then a conditional second fourth and seventh those conditionals would obviously kick in if Callie plays a game with the north bay battalion but this is the third time already this offseason that a first rounder has been declared defected, traded away. And that means three teams, the Sioux Greyhounds, the Brampton Steelheads, and the Kingston Frontenacs are going to get compensatory first round draft picks next year. That means two first rounders for those three teams. Strategic play, hard to say. So some of these teams, when they actually draft a player who is fairly well known is not going to come to the OHL, at least this year, sometimes it's a it's a veteran-laden team that wasn't going to have much space for a rookie anyway, and they t say, well, let's you know throw a dart at the board here, trade his rights, get the compensatory pick, two picks next year, a couple conditional picks this year. A strategy play, maybe. Um, in some cases, a little bit puzzling. Uh, 
I, I don't know in these three cases for sure. I know that it was very unlikely uh, Cal Malholtra was ever going to report to Kingston. Um, so you see some of these moves are a little curious. And, and you mentioned the Sioux as well, Mike. That's another one where um, taking a big gamble when you don't have any of your first couple picks report. So, yeah, I think I think there's some concern in the Sioux right now based on how things have gone early this year through camp. But yeah, this this whole idea of the compensatory picks, Mike, I think uh, one thing I probably noticed the most to point out is just that the returns on them seem a little lighter this year than than in the past. And that could just be because of the likelihood of these kids reporting um, being lesser so than in the past. But also, I wonder if there's something going around behind the scenes in the league. There's been some talk about, you know, we've got to tone down these prices. It doesn't look good to the rest of the league when these little kind of collusion type deals happen. So who knows, Mike, but the prices were a little bit more reasonable this year, I found. I would agree with that. And when you go back and look, I started, I've been giving this maybe too much thought. I don't know, Dan. And I've said this before, you know, is there a loophole here that needs to be closed by the Ontario Hockey League? The, the example that first comes to mind for me is of course when Doug Gilmore as the general manager of the Kingston Frontenacs drafted Max Domi and everybody knew at the time that Domi wanted to go to the London Knights and and you know Ontario Hockey League folklore has it that Gilmore soured his professional relationship with Ty Domi Max's dad by drafting Max to Kingston when everybody knew he wanted to go to London but what Kingston ends up getting of course is that compensatory first pick and the following year so Domi obviously ends up in London and and the Fronts get a, a decent price for him. And then the following year, they get four of the top 24 picks in the league with Roland McEwen and Sam Bennett. They're two first rounders, Dylan DePerna and then Spencer Watson in the second round, Watson being that second, second rounder at number 24. No disrespect to Dylan DePerna, but looking back on that, everybody at the time was saying with McEwen, Bennett, Watson on this team, such high picks, the Frontenacs were going to be rolling on their way to a title, which of course never happened, would have been the first in franchise history. We've documented that well over the life of this podcast. But that takes us back to 2011 when that happened. Fast forward a decade, and this is where we're starting to see it accelerating. And that's why I'm asking the question, like, is there a loophole here? In 2021, the Ottawa 67s trade away Nicholas Moldenhauer's rights to the Sarnia Sting. Moldenhauer doesn't end up playing, but the 67s get back-to-back first rounders. How about Henry Muse and Frankie Morelli? Hank and Frank still patrolling that blue line in Ottawa and doing very well. Thank you very much. The following season, that's when the Ice Dogs send Sam Dickinson to the London Knights, right? And then Niagara ends up with the compensatory pick. They get Ryan Rubrick and Ethan Shada in the following year. We know the Kitchener Rangers did the same thing. We've talked about this with Michael Hag to Sudbury. What does that turn into for Kitchener? But Cameron Reed and Luca Romano. So again, three times now when you add Ryder Cali into that and uh, Adam Valentini, the Rangers acquiring Valentini from Brampton this year and Cali we just talked about. So that's five times in four years since 2021 that we've seen teams take advantage of this opportunity. I, I can see the argument, Dan, that you don't want to dissuade teams from going after the best player. But it seems to me that the price, the, the the risk is incredibly low. Like obviously go after the best player because you want to recruit him to what you believe to be the best development league. And I think you and I still agree on that. The OHL is that. And to the best franchise in that league. You believe in your franchise. That's why you think you can attract the player here. But boy, oh boy, the risk is really low lately, it seems to me, when you try to lure that player. Oh, it didn't work? Well, I'll find somebody else who thinks they might be able to. And by the way, I'm going to get two first rounders the following year. I don't know what the answer is, but it's just, it's happening an awful lot. It is. And I think I've floated the idea on this podcast before that I like the idea of either you take the compensatory pick or the return you get from another team for his rights. You don't get both. You don't get to double dip. There's there's other mechanisms we could put in place too. Like maybe there is a set cost for dealing for players' rights. And whatever that is, I don't know. Maybe like a second and a fifth. And whoever offers you that first, that offer first you take. Um, I think the loophole 
that we're having trouble with. You mentioned the Sam Dickinson one, Mike, and and we heard uh, Rangers GM Mike McKenzie this year say that the Rangers haven't picked high enough in a draft for a long time to get access to players like Adam Valentini. So this is one of the few opportunities they have to get a player of that ilk, whether he reports or not. In the Sam Dickinson one, I wonder if the thinking's the same. Is London's picking lower down in the first round? And they think, well, we're never going to have access Niagara, take this guy and we're going to compensate you well to send him our way. So to the rest of the league, it's like, well, I don't know, this is kind of an end run to find these players because like you said, Mike, the risk is not high enough for the team that's drafting that player because they know they're going to make a killing both with the compensatory pick and whatever package they receive. So when it's too enticing for a team to make those selections and move them to, to higher end teams potentially, then it becomes a bit of a problem for the rest of the league. So, so I'm with you. There's, there's got to be some sort of mechanisms in place to to prevent it from being a, a completely no risk maneuver for these teams, right? This all started by us talking about the Sioux Greyhounds and calling out the Hounds fans for not yet answering roll call. I'll just finish up some housekeeping there. The Hounds did wave uh, Julian Fantino, one of their overagers, and it hit right on something you mentioned last week, Dan. Uh, Sue was one of those teams with a bit of a glut, five OAs coming into the season. And you said last week on this podcast that oftentimes these conversations have begun during exit interviews at the end of the previous season. And Kyle Raftis, the GM in Sault Ste. Marie, said as much. And Fantino quickly found himself a place with the Toronto Metropolitan University Hockey Club. So he's going to take advantage of that uh, school package and head into U Sports with TMU, formerly Ryerson University. But they still have four OAs up there in the Sioux. Uh, in Justin DeZotti, Caden Carlisle, Charlie Schenkel, and Owen Allard. So decisions still to be made up in Sault Ste. Marie, and roll call still to be answered, you Hounds fans. Uh, speaking of OAs, the other piece of business we should touch on, though it's not in the O, very much connected, and a Regina Pats overager coming into his final year in Major Junior in the CHL has already announced that next year he is committing to the NCAA. There was a time that such a move could not possibly happen, but now... I won't say the floodgates are beginning to open, but that becomes a possibility. It sure does. And we teased this earlier, Mike. We knew that there was rumbling this was coming. Uh, it hasn't officially come yet. But the fact that this player is committing to Arizona State, to an NCAA Division One team, formally is a suggestion that they know what's coming down the pipe. It's just a matter of time. Lawyers have been advising, player agents, family advisors, they know what's coming. Otherwise, you wouldn't get this type of announcement. And I think there's going to be lots of discussion on this over the next few months, Mike, about what it means for every league. I, I think what we're seeing in this case is a player that honored his five-year commitment to the Regina Pats and is moving on to use his CHL education package in the south of the border, which is terrific for these players. So I, I think by weight on balance, it's probably going to just mean more opportunity for these players in the leagues like the OHL and any CHL league will be able to retain some of these younger players, these 16 year olds that were drafted because instead of having to go to the USHL or BCHL to bide your time till you get to the NCAA, you could actually go play in those leagues now and 16, 17 year old seasons. The question will be, will some of those players jump at 17 and go to the States? As of right now, they're, they're, player contract agreement, a scholarship and education agreement with the OHL team binds them to that team for the duration of their, their time. However, that could change as well. So a lot still up in the air, Mike, but I think all it's going to mean in the short term is that we might see a few more of these younger players dip their toes in the CHL waters. I suspect it will be changing in the manner that you suggest, Dan, that we will see players jumping earlier and i'm i'm not sure how i feel about that what i do like and you mentioned it is the fact uh that the player has honored will have honored his commitment to the whl's regina pats before making that leap and i'm good with i think you know your your word is your bond your commitment is your commitment and listen i, I get it i don't think anybody and my bias for the ohl notwithstanding i don't think anybody's being uh unduly punished by having to play four or five years and what I still believe to be the greatest junior hockey league or greatest development league in the world. But I really like the wider 
options, the, the greater options that players have. And if the NCAA is the route they think they're going to develop best or maybe just get the best educational experience, I don't know what it is, but whatever that may be, if they think that's the route, I'm glad that they're going to have the chance to do that. And I, I don't think that this will be the last case that we we hear about for sure. So it's the very beginning of uh, a bit of a, a, a sea change in uh, major junior hockey. And and if any league is going to maybe suffer for this, Dan, it it might be U Sports here in Canada. Yeah, that fair point, definitely. And, and a lot of people, I think, sometimes misunderstand that the NCAA – in and of itself, in terms of what it offers for hockey players. The Macklin Celebrinis are rare. You don't often go play a, a prominent role on an NCAA team at 17, 18 years old like you would in junior. A lot of those players, it's 19, 20, 21 before they're earning a lot of ice time there. So the bulk of players that leave junior hockey at 20 years old, like you said, go on to U Sports in Canada, can play hockey there. There was never an issue. They couldn't go on to NCAA and play hockey there because of this. So now they can. So it just like you said, Mike opens a whole wide range of options to those players who likely weren't ready to play NCAA hockey at 18 or 19 anyway, but might be by the time they're 21. So it's just more options for them. And I think that's a good thing, uh, especially for junior hockey players. Absolutely. And it makes programs strive to be better so they can attract some of the very best players, whether that's in the NCAA, whether that's in the Ontario Hockey League or the dub or the Q across the CHL, whether that's in U sports. So hopefully this is just benefit to the player, which I think is the way it should be. You are, after all, availing yourself of their services for the time that they spend with you. All right. Uh, that's business. Are you? This is supposed to be the Eastern Conference preview episode of the OHL podcast. Dan? Are you ready for this? It's it's the first step of a, of a long season, and we I know the fans will let us know. Everybody that but the Sioux has checked in with roll call, so they're paying attention to what you're about to say about their team. Do I uh, have time to go change to a Chicago White Sox shirt? I'm going to make a fool of myself. I might as well go all in. Wow, so. nicely done. I don't know what the White Sox did to deserve that, but well played, well played. <laughs> I'm going to be the old guy here for a sec too, if you don't mind. You remember back in the day, like. Foster Hewitt made he shoots he scores like the thing right that's that's all you had to say he he made it an iconic phrase in sports broadcasting he shoots he scores you notice now like you don't just score right you you snipe you go bar down you go top cheese like is it just me or is there a whole lot of language that I have to learn again every year dad <laughs> there always is Mike and you know I uh, it's probably the old guy and me speaking as well but I I've never really totally got on board with all. I don't know why we need new words for everything all the time. I get from a broadcaster standpoint, you don't want to repeat yourself over and over. So you need some different, but the, uh, the hipster words I can do without, let's just say that. <laughs> well, as you know, very well, it is not just hockey. Oh no, it's not. We've got different words for scoring things in every sport. Let me use football for an example. Is it a TD? Is it a tutty? Is it taking it to the house? Well, whatever you call a touchdown, they matter more at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL and a partner of the OHL podcast. Ready to place your first NFL bet? Try betting on something simple like a player to score a touchdown. Think of your favorite player. Look up the odds at the DraftKings Sportsbook. Make your wager on your favorite player to score a touchdown. And then... Get ready to do a touchdown dance of your own. Score big with DraftKings Sportsbook, the number one place to bet touchdowns. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code THPN. That's code THPN for new customers to get $250 in bonus bets when you bet just five bucks and get one month of NFL Plus premium only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. Okay, Dan, we didn't talk about this in advance, but here's the way I decided to do it. Let's, I know, right? Ex how do you like working with me, by the way? <laughs> Executive I, decision, here's how it's going to be. It's all good, all good. <laughs> I, I, someone wants to dictate how my day is going to go. It makes less thinking for me, so you go ahead. <laughs> okay, well, I hope you thought about this at least a little bit before coming in, because you will have to defend these or at least laugh at yourself later on. But I think we should start this way. 
which two teams in the East are you picking to miss the playoffs? That's when I look at things, this is kind of how I start, to be honest with you. So I thought we'll start it this way. Which two are not going to make it, Dan Mahar? I'm not going to be able to show my face in these cities now, Mike. Real, <laughs> but I guess I was going to have to reveal them anyway. So, That's all right. right. Brace yourself. The two I have missing the playoffs are the North Bay Battalion and the Peterborough Peets. Interesting. Would it surprise you in any way if the two teams I have missing the playoffs are different than your two teams? It would not surprise me at all, Mike, because I wrote and rewrote this list like five times. So this is what I've landed on as of this podcast. I'll probably change my mind five minutes after we're done. But no, it doesn't surprise me. Yours are different. So Who have you got? Well, I'll get to that in just a second. So based on what you just said, though, would you agree? Because I made this little note in a box beside my list. Would you agree that we could probably, I bet you we'll have a similar top four, just maybe yes. not in the same order. And then the bottom four, well, actually, I think we just proved my point. I thought the bottom four were kind of like put him in a hat and pick out a name. I agree. I yeah. might, yeah, bottom four for sure, maybe five, but I, I, I agree with you. We're also probably going to have the same top four. So you've got North Bay and Peterborough out. Yes. And I have North Bay and Peterborough squeaking in. I have, I'm so sorry, St. Catharines. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but I have the Niagara Ice Dogs missing again, along with the Sudbury Wolves. So, Dan, you start 10 and 9 and why? So 10, Peterborough Peets. I just feel they're still too young. They don't have as many key departures as you'd expect. I'd go over on, with all due respect to a couple of the players like Cam Govro at the door. They made so many moves last year to, to recoup some assets for their veteran players that they're not getting hit hard by losses over the offseason. Having said that, so many 16-year-old players by the end of last season. Uh, adding a couple more now. Uh, I just feel they're, they're so young that they're going to struggle in the depth deep parts of the season especially when you get past christmas and and there's a lot of wear and tear on those players and they're starting to draw really tough matchups because the coaches are starting to to lean heavily on their top two lines in the second half uh so i i just i feel like peterborough is just a year away mike from from playoffs um they really went all in for their championship years and they've paid a bit of a price now nothing against them i just a year away is is going to be my excuse fans in peterborough and to your question about north bay this one I really struggle with, Mike. I will say there were iterations of my list where these two teams were in the playoffs, and I feel kind of nuts picking the battalion not to be in the playoffs because their track record is stellar under this coaching staff, under this GM. Uh, feels like they'll find a way, uh, but when I look at the roster, just hammered with with critical losses. They won it all in two years ago, really. Last year was supposed to be a bit of a step back and they were so good. They went all in again and, uh, you know, acquiring Bill Manis, the LeBlanc twins, um, lots of key acquisitions again last year that cost them more collateral. And I think that they might be paying the piper a bit this year. Uh, I just, that wrong seasons, Mike, and on paper, I have them ninth, even though I know they always prove me wrong. So that's my rationale on those two, Mike. Um, uh, what about yours? That's what makes this fun. Yeah. So I I struggled because I'm not trying to be cruel to anybody. I'm not trying to be unkind. I'm not trying to be that guy. But how many times have I said, when somebody shows you who they are, believe them. And, and the Niagara Ice Dogs have not just missed the playoffs in back-to-back -back seasons. They have finished dead last in the league in back-to-back -back seasons. And it's not like they were just on the cusp last year. They were 18 points out of a playoff spot. That's a lot of ground to make up. So if the Ice Dogs miss again, they'll have the dubious distinction of tying the Erie Otters. If you're counting the pandemic years, 2020, we got cut off. 2021, we didn't play. But it would become six straight years of missing the playoffs for the Ice Dogs organization. I... I'm a little bit confused by the Froloff and Podricar deal to bring in 
Browdy and Scott. I, I like Jack Browdy a whole lot and I've got nothing against Blair Scott, but I thought Froloff and Padrakar had, you know, showed enough last year that, and I'm not in the room. So maybe they had reasons for that. Things that I do like about the ice dogs for sure. I hear great things about Andre Lushko, the uh, import that they've got coming in. Kevin, he I'll, I'll take Kevin. He on my team any day of the week. And then Owen Flores is the wild card there as an OA in goal. Could he be enough? But what I see happening is what has happened in seasons past where there's too much tinkering for my liking and the team will just never really be able, despite its best efforts, to establish an identity. So I've got, I'm sorry, Ice Dogs fans, I've got you in 10th again. And then I've dropped Sudbury and this was not easy either, but I've dropped them out because obviously... They went for it last year. They're going to have to recoup. And while there are still pieces they can move to begin restocking that cupboard, I I don't see the goaltending they're going to need. And that was an issue last year. And as much as I love Scott Barney coming in as the coach, and I've heard nothing but great things about him, I think this is a year that it's going to be a step way back for the Sudbury Wolves, and they will finish ninth in the conference. So Sudbury nine, Niagara 10 on my end. So you've got one of those two, Dan in eighth spot. I do. Uh, I have the Niagara ice dogs in eighth spot and, and believe it or not, Mike, on some of the iterations that I had, I had them a bit higher and I just looked at the overall age composition of the roster and had to bump them down to eighth because of kind of what you said earlier, Mike, when they show you what you are, believe. And I believe that, the Niagara Ice Dogs have a lot to prove to earn a reputational boost, I guess, if you will. But what the, I'll tell you why I have them making the playoffs this year, Mike. So I've watched a bit of their preseason. I love, love, love the talent they brought in. I know you mentioned Padrakar and, and Frolov and some of the players that have moved on. But bringing in Virgilio Van Vliet, two very credible defenders. Love Jack Brody's preseason. He looked incredible. Uh, I think, like breakout season if you're picking top five breakout players this year he's on my list and then the young talent so we talked about ryan robert uh reporting last year he's there brady wasselin just looked like a veteran all preseason uh great hands in tight uh still young i mean we've got the kevin he's you've got some of the, the veterans there that are now at the senior end of their tenure in the ohl ready they've been through the wars they've been through the downside uh, in niagara and often when a player does that by the time they hit 18 19 they're ready to actually do something and i i don't know the goaltending question mark Owen flores do they stick with him they've got charlie robertson as well big kid that's had a terrific preseason as well so i i don't know what they're doing in the crease just yet but i see credible options either way and i love the young talent there so i feel like they get in the playoffs this year mike all right, so you've got Niagara two spots ahead of me. I've got them 10, you've got them 8. You put the Peets in 10th, and I've got them 8th. You've already explained your reasons for dropping them, and you're you're so right with the youth, the young team, but here's the way I look at the Peets. You remember last season, we were talking about both Peterborough and Kitchener early on, and Kitchener sustained it a little bit longer because Peterborough, once the sale started happening, there was just there was really no turning back and they had to do what they had to do last year. They had to do what they did because they're coming off the championship, but don't forget the young. So it, it tails off, but that young talent you talked about and, and they had that really tough second half, second, two thirds of the season, but that young group got a chance to start playing together, got a chance to understand the Peterborough Pete's culture. Rob Wilson demands hard work. There's no question about that. And you've got just, I, I just love the talent on the Peets. I mean, you've got Caden Taylor, who was a ninth overall pick to Sudbury last year. Now a first rounder now with uh, the Peterborough Peets, Aiden Young from Saginaw. He was the 16th pick last year. And Nico Addy, of course, from Owen Sound. He was the 12th pick last year. You add to that your own defenseman, Carson Cameron, who was the 13th. That is four first rounders from last year's draft with this Peets team. I think they're strong enough in goal. They'll work hard and they will squeak into eighth place. That's my prediction. Who do you have number seven? Uh, first, I'll just say that's very, very well argued, Mike. I'll give you that. Um, yeah, I, so no no issue there. Um, 
not surprisingly at seven, Mike, uh, I have the Sudbury Wolves popping in at seven. And similar reasons that you had for dropping them. I mean, if you look at their list of key departures, it is long. Uh, it's hard to recover from that, especially considering they're a team that underachieved last year. So one could say, well, they've turned over a lot of the roster. Maybe things will look brighter. Um, Scott Barney has his work cut out for him. I think that the coaching is probably going to be one of their strong suits. Also, Mike, should have said this up front, but all these predictions come with 101 caveats, do they not? Absolutely. We- Thank you for bringing <laughs> Yes, right? yes, they do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like who's returning from the pros? Who's like, uh, there's injury, all those things. Um, and with Sudbury, I raise it now because is Dalibor Dvorsky coming back? Is Quentin Musty coming back? Two big question marks right there. I think probably on Musty, not sure on Dvorsky. Those are two huge pieces if they're not there. If they are there, then yeah, maybe maybe seven, eight is a bit low for this team. But uh, like you said, huge question mark and goal. Nate Krawcheck could take the crease and run with it. Uh, who knows? Uh, just a lot of question marks there. And this was a team that was mid to low pack last year, even though they shouldn't have been. And then obviously had the huge losses in the off season. So seven was about as high as I could go there, Mike, but who, and who you got? I, I see to your point, Dan, those players, should they return be on their way out the door as quickly as yeah. they can be moved yeah. so that Rob Papineau can restock the cover, right? So what happened to the Peets last year, I think, happens to the Sudbury Wolves this year. I have it seven, and I went back and forth on this so many times. You've got them ninth. I will confess to, I I think, a large soft spot. And I've mentioned this before. I think underrated track record in North Bay. Since the team went up there, they had back-to-back runs to the conference championship in their first two years, and they're just coming off three straight runs you already talked about the general manager adam dennis the coach ryan ulihan and the entire staff i i just really like what they've done and i can't get out of my head the van steensels the romanis and the wakeleys who are going to put up numbers for you for however long they're there so i'm just thinking again how much can they put in the bank before they have to start taking some lumps And with a group like that, not to mention Mike McIver in goal, who was terrific, just terrific last year, I'm thinking, yeah, obviously North Bay that finished first in the division and second in the conference last year is not going to be there, but are they falling right out of the dance? I say no, so I have the battalion at number seven. So our bottom four, (laughs) like I suspected coming in, we're just going to be interchangeable parts. I think the top four uh, will be very similar. So what happens in this uh, in this middle two, Dan? Who do you got for number six? Uh, sure. And just quickly, if I could, Mike, on the North Bay, I should have thrown in my caveat when I picked them to miss the playoffs. Uh, I'm assuming that those players you mentioned won't stay long. Um, not sure Dallin Wakeley's coming back. Might Not sure yet. And then trades potentially so i i made my projection based on thinking those players would be moved out so thank you for referencing that uh at number six i have and i'm probably a touch higher than i wanted to put them but reputational boost for the work that dave cameron has done the ottawa 67s i have it at six and again another team just a lot of lineup turned over in the last two years and always seem to manage to find a way to be competitive. It's never an easy game when you go into Ottawa on a Sunday afternoon. I think they just find ways to win and there's still plenty of talent there. We know, you know, you're going to have Muse on the back end running that power play. You're good. There's a lot of ability still there. I just see that roster much like North Bay is just thinned out over the last two seasons. And I have trouble seeing them much higher than, than six based on the strength of the top of the conference. But uh, who you got there, Mike? Do you mind if I just say uh, ditto? Oh, there you go. <laughs> and, and and for the reasons that you mentioned, uh, reputationally, they deserve it. Muse and Morelli, I love Mayich. Let's call him 3M on the blue line there. But you touched on something else in Dave Cameron too. And if it's one thing we know about Dave Cameron's teams, it's that they will be, they'll have a defense first mindset. So they're going to be difficult to play against. Uh, he demands the hard work that he gets. And anyway, for all the reasons you just outlined, I also have the Ottawa 67s at number six. And I will throw in that I'm, I'm very interested in Colin McKenzie's season ahead. And I'm going on the bit of an assumption here because we're still in the preseason, but uh, likely the man to take the crease over Ian Micheloni. And 
I, I think McKenzie still has something to show, something to give to this league and the Ottawa 67s. So that becomes a bit of a wild card. But dare I say, if both of us are picking the Ottawa 67s sixth, that is the kiss of death. If we agree on it, they're doomed. <laughs> Sorry, Ottawa fans. <laughs> Yeah, I, and you know why it's not just at six. I have a feeling where there's going to be a few dittos going forward here because I think we're getting into a, a, a stretch where we might agree a little more, which is probably not good. But the top four will be very interesting. Yeah. I'll bet you. I'll bet you dollars to donuts. And Dan have not. Dan and I have not talked about this in advance. But that when we get to the top four, you're going to hear the same four teams' names, likely just in a different order. Along with those four, there is one more. Still five teams for us to run down. Although if we're going to agree on the top four, just in a different order, I think we're going to have the same number five. Uh, that's all still to come as we keep up with our Eastern Conference predictions here on the OHL podcast. This episode is sponsored by Better Help. What's something that you would love to learn? Like as an adult, do you ever make time to learn new things as often as you'd like? Or was that lost in childhood? Well, if you've ever tried therapy, and I have, let me just tell you that it's not necessarily something you have to do or attend after a major trauma. You can do it just so you can develop better coping skills, setting boundaries. Taking therapy can empower you to be the best version of yourself. And if you're thinking of trying therapy, why not give better help? A try. It is entirely online, so it's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. So that should take away a lot of the reasons you might not consider therapy. Rediscover your curiosity with better help. Visit betterhelp.com slash THPN today and get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash THPN. All right, five down, five to go, Dan Mahar. And I, I think if, I, if I'm doing the math and I carry the one, you and I both have the Kingston Frontenacs finishing fifth this season. That, that is exactly who I have at five. <laughs> and, and I will say that rationale is reversed from my, my pick of the Ottawa 67s at six, where Kingston actually wanted to place lower. Or sorry, want don't trust them Mike is my is what I'm driving at because of what they've done over the last few years I I picked them to be better in the playoffs they proved me wrong so they keep doing this to me I just look at the exodus uh you know Roman Schmidt Paul Ludwinski uh, you, you could go down the list Jax Dubois who they acquired last year there's all kinds of talent out the door I love that they picked up a couple veteran players, uh, Lalonde and Nett, a good pickup. You've got uh, Cedric Gendon uh, looking to revive his career as an overager there. Should put up good good totals in Kingston. They're an older team, Mike, and older teams tend to translate into at least mid-standings, which the roster out the door, in the door, I see a bit of a wash. Um, some good young talent there as well. Um, keeping up the Finnish connection with the imports, which has served them well. So there's there's enough to be excited there that this team should contend. I just look at the four teams above them and think uh, one of these things is not like the other. But uh, what do you think there, Mike? I think almost exactly what you thought, Dan. And especially the part about once bitten or maybe three times bitten, four times shy here. I just, I feel like... I've been waiting and wanting the Kingston Frontenacs to give me a little bit more. Remember, last year should have been a, a go-for-it year because they were in the bidding, at least, to host the Memorial Cup when it went to Saginaw. But when you when you go in the bidding, you figure you're going to have a team that will compete. And then they kind of, not to be too hard on them, but let us down in that regard. So when I was just thinking about this in my mind before I started looking around, I actually thought, well, Kingston forget about it. Like they already traded away Christopher Thibodeau, right? They already tr traded away Gabriel Frasca. But then I looked at the roster and I thought, well, hang on a second here. Roster composition is, isn't too bad. Cedric Gandone's over there now. Ethan Miedema is a player I've liked since he was yeah. in Windsor and he fits in nicely up there. I, I don't mind that you talked to your points well taken, Jack Dubois, uh, Roman Schmidt and others, but I, I don't, I don't mind the way the D looks right now with Quinton Burns and Cal Ewins and uh, Jakob Chromiak in there. So 
you have that, and you mentioned Nolan Lalonde. I think, with no disrespect intended to Mason Vicari, he he was carrying way too much weight last year, way too much weight. So I think Lalonde's a breath of fresh air there, and we better not forget about Trent Mann behind the bench. We just better not forget about that because he's going to have now a full season to come in here, not to mention the exit interviews last year, the off season, the preseason, et cetera. And yeah, all of that added up to me slotting the fronts in fifth place. Yeah. I think we're in full agreement there, Mike. And, and I think give or take a spot, that's going to be where they land. I should have made my only prediction, Dan, that the bottom four and the top four were kind of put names in a hat and pull them out because that's what has happened. We had uh, differences in our bottom four. Let's find out how different, if at all, our top four is. Who you got at number four? All right, Mike. I have up the 400 highway to Barry. I've got the Colts at four. Um, I think the pack of four, as we've referenced a couple of times, have separated themselves in this conference, at least on paper, to start the year. I talked in a previous podcast how I love this sneaky, under-the-radar additions of Brad Gardner and Tristan Bertucci, huge ads. Hillenbrand, Hillenbrand looks terrific in that if if he's the, the guy there all year. Um, in the preseason, just been phenomenal. I, I'm a big believer in Bo Jelsma. I, they just, there's a lot of talent there. Learned some lessons last year. I think came on at the end of the year. Gave a little bit of a scare in the playoffs and now Ray take another step forward, having added a couple veteran players. I think they get themselves into the top four, Mike. I also have the Barry Colts at number four, but I want, I want the opportunity to put an asterisk beside it. Not that I think necessarily they'll be seventh, but I think there are so many things that could happen that could make them second or first or well, maybe not seventh, but so I'll start with uh, Bo Akey, who did not play just this past weekend in the Young Stars Classic with the Edmonton Oilers. We know he's coming back from a devastating shoulder injury. So am I reading too much into that? Maybe, probably, but an unhealthy Bo Akey is a bad sign starting the season because hit the loss of him last year changed the trajectory of that Colts team entirely. The other real wild card in all of this, and I mentioned this earlier when we started our season here on the OHL podcast, I don't love getting into the rumor mill. There are plenty of rumors to go around. They are very difficult to substantiate, but the strong rumors, and we touched on them, are that Colby Barlow is not thrilled in Owen Sound and possible destinations for him, rumored Oshawa, Barry. So if we have a healthy Boakey, and we add Colby Barlow, what does that do to the team whose praises you already sung? Dan, I I think it does a lot of good things for them, to say the very least. But I'm I'm keeping them at four right now. Uh, Cole Baudouin and their import, Emil Henning up front, both NHL first-rounders. You mentioned a Hildebrandt and goal. You remember what he did last year, especially into the playoffs. And I, I think the team's got... Uh, it's it's got some real nice pieces how they all come together and how healthy achy is remains to be seen but i've got them fourth as well yeah i think everything you just said makes a ton of sense mike and the wild cards you just mentioned rumored acquisition potentially of of barlow and then hemming uh, for sure high-end nhl talent dropped in much like edward chalet who didn't necessarily perform to expectations but similar pedigree uh, Barry has potential, especially with acquisitions, to see themselves rise from four, I believe, as opposed to sink. Okay. I, I, and I would agree with that, too. The, the likelihood of sinking is is far less than the likelihood of actually going higher than four. Who yeah. do you have, Dan Mahar, at number three? So this is another one that's a bit reputational for me, Mike, because I think that they're greater than the sum of their parts. And that is the Brantford. Or sorry. I did. Yes. Brantford right. Bulldogs. I had it. I, was, I thought I, I thought I blew it. There. Sorry. Uh, Brantford Bulldogs are my third. Uh, I have it third, Mike. I'll tell you why. So I think they're a little thin on D. I think there's some help could come there. Uh, not no offense to hard hitters, Owen Prots, uh, Okatundu. They've got some some compete there, but those two players are kind of the epitome of that team. They're physical. They're hard. They go at you. 
And I think when we talk about Jake O'Brien, Nick Lardis, Merrick Van Acker, those players alone get you in the top three or four in the conference, just the way they compete in battle. Uh, I believe the addition of Ryerson Leanders in net, you've got a high-end goaltender now. Uh, and then you've got a bunch of other talent around the periphery with Patrick Thomas. And you go down, so you go down the lineup with the experience they've gained um, through the playoffs in the past couple of years, a year older for those players. I think you're going to see some star seasons from those players I just mentioned and the supporting cast and just the way Jay McKee gets them to battle, be heavy, hard to play against. I, I, I couldn't drop them lower than three, Mike. I don't know that I could add anything to what you just said. I also have Brantford at number three, and I confess you you use the word reputationally. I'll I'll use it again. A, a little bit of a soft spot, much like for North Bay, but just look at what this team has done. 18, a run to the championship. 22, they win the championship. Lots of people saying they maybe played a little bit above themselves last year, but I love the team that general manager Matt Turek has built. You talked about Jay McKee as a coach. There's been a great deal of consistency with this organization dating back to the Hamilton days, but there's they're building, they have built something and it, it's successful for the reasons you just mentioned. And speaking of coaching, Jay McKee and Andreas Carlson, I, I describe them as kind of like Batman and Robin since they came into this league together with the Kitchener Rangers. Carlson gets scooped up by the Edmonton Oilers to take on a player development role. So what do the Bulldogs do? They keep it in the family and go back to Vince Lays, who was there as the coach when the Bulldogs in Hamilton were winning it in 2018. They don't miss a beat. As far as I'm concerned, I really like the way the team is constructed. You put Ryerson Leanders in goal and uh, okay. So we have three, four, five, and six, the same. I wonder how we're going to do one, two, Dan, who you got second. Second. Okay. I, I struggle with this one, Mike. And when I get to number one, I'm going to throw out a bunch of caveats at you to explain why I made that decision. <laughs> Cause this one I struggled with, but at number two, Mike, I have the Brampton Steelheads. And the reason I have the Brampton Steelheads and they easily could have been one. I redid this one a bunch of times. Uh, I, the Brampton Steelheads are loaded for bear. We all see it. They have everything you need. They have the coaching. They have a GM that's shrewd and gets them what they need. They have a draft pick covered that's loaded for Bear to get more down the stretch, which I think will be a, a big minute eating defender. If if I had my guess, uh, Matthew Andonovsky potentially, someone <laughs> like that. Uh, they're they're loaded. Uh, they can skate. They can move the puck. They can score. We talk about Porter Martone all the time. We talk about Angus McDonnell up front. Uh, we got Luke Misa up front. They added oh. Uh, that guy Rakoff, what's uh, what do you have? Fifty some yeah. goals. Uh, I mean, they're just, just a few. Yeah, yeah, just a, just a, an embarrassment of riches in Brampton this year. And Ivan Kovic and Net, who is Canada's U eighteen star. Um, and when I get to number one, which is getting pretty obvious now, I'll explain. But I think one of the things is him being so young is a bit of a question mark. Uh, they have Gibbons uh, and Net behind him there's some question marks potentially there even though i'm a huge believer in ivan kovac i think he's a terrific goaltender um championship pedigree over time so uh, easily could have been my number one but i got i got this deal into two mike who you got so it's so interesting when you mentioned the caveats you have for number one because i think that's why i have the oshawa generals at number two for every reason you just outlined and again like what am I living under a rock? I know I'm from Kitchener, but there's not a big rock over my head. Okay. So you got to love the Brampton Steelheads coming into the season, loaded for bear, all the, they're going to add, et cetera, et cetera. You nailed it, Dan. That's why I have them number one. You got to love that offense. The only thing you might say is there's only one puck over there, right? There's only one yeah. puck, but it's going to be fun to watch. Brampton, I know you really don't care, but try, try to care. Tell a friend it's going to be a great team to watch. I have Oshawa at number two, and I wrestled with this too, because who didn't love what Oshawa did last season? Who doesn't love the players that were a part of that that'll come back and do it all again? Hello, Beckett Seneca. Hello, Callum Ritchie. Hello, Ben Danford, et cetera, right on down the line. Two things stand out to me, and I, I kind of hate to say it because I, I loved his season so much, and I love it when a guy gets a change of scenery and becomes a brand new player. So I'm 
I'm on the Jacob Oster Express. I am. But I'm I'm asking, having watched him in the Western Conference with Guelph, there's no question he was terrific for the Oshawa Generals last year. Is Jacob Oster that Jacob Oster? Or is he the one we knew before he got to Oshawa? Again, he's got plenty of reason for us to believe in him, and, and I'm on the Express. But I wondered, maybe. So that gave me pause, and then I... I have nothing to get. I love how they kept it in the family. It's a good organization. And Steve O'Rourke comes in as the head coach. But I think that Oshawa's performance last year had more. I'm not taking anything away from the players, but I don't think Derek Lapstall, despite being a coach of the year, gets enough credit for what he did. So can O'Rourke ring the same performances out of these players this year? By all accounts in Oshawa, he can and will, but he's the new man and the old guy's gone to the pros after doing great things with the team last year. So that's why I just, I, those little nagging questions and you can feel free to chirp me later because I've got Oshawa too and then Brampton at number one. Do I touch on your caveats? You Oh, you did, Mike. You, you asked all the same questions I did and this is why I had so much trouble. So a lot of my caveats, as you mentioned, are dependent upon a number of these questions being answered. So the biggest question I had was awarding number one in the conference to a rookie coach. Kept in the family though, and everything I'm hearing, O'Rourke's well-loved there, has the same approach as Laxdahl did. Uh, there sh should be fairly seamless, but you never know. So that was the biggest question in my mind. I don't have nearly as many questions about Oster. I think in this league, we tend to see goaltenders improve as they get older. And we've seen some goaltenders that were pretty average until their OA year, and they were phenomenal in their OA year. Well, Oster was phenomenal last year. So I I believe it's the real deal. I think you're only going to get that this year. And that was the big thing for me that set Oshawa apart from a lot of the other teams in the top was that, again, nothing against Ivan Kovic, but a 17-year-old goal, that's asking a lot to carry a team to a championship versus a 20-year-old goaltender. So that was a big one. And then, of course, the caveats, Mike, does Richie come back? I'm assuming yes. Dylan Robrecht, maybe. Possibly. They lost Kumpalan and that's a lot to replace. They've got a lot of uh, talent they've injected and I'm I'm still hearing those Colby Barlow whispers. I know Oshawa is going to add someone else for sure. So I'm, I'm looking at what they're going to do on top of what they've got. Beckett Seneca, once he's fully healed, could have a monster year. You, you referenced Danford on D. They've got, they've, they're battle tested. They ran through the playoffs last year. They looked terrific. Uh, I, I just think that there's so much there. I couldn't bet against them if some of those chips fall in place. So there's a few caveats there, but I've got the Jennies. It's a good point on Ivan Kovic. And I did, listen, I'll be honest. I was on Brampton coming in. And when I looked a little deeper, I only reinforced my belief. So it was confirmation bias for me. However, uh, I, I was curious, you know, Ivan Kovic, to your point, 17 years old, carrying a team to a championship. He got more games last year than I seemed to remember. He played 25 games. He was a 272 goals against and a 915 save percentage. Now, I know 25 versus the 40 plus he's going to play this year. I get it, but it's his draft year. This kid's the real deal. I'm not worried about that in Brampton, but bottom line is uh, it's going to be tons of fun. So it's it's interesting, Dan. So I, I kind of thought when I looked at this, you have the the four teams near the bottom. And the four teams that you could probably, you know, move around the top. And then what I called a mushy middle. You and I, for whatever reason, ended up uh, spot on matching up three through six in the mushy middle of the conference. So there you go. Yeah, well, I guess, you know, if we're going to look foolish, we'll look foolish together. Hey, how about that? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I have my uh, fancy region of Waterloo airport uh, notebook here, fly YKF for all you, listen, they, they don't fly a lot of places, but if you get a chance, you'll love it. Come right into Breslau. Uh, so I've made the notes in my notebook here so that I have it listed out. So I have one through 10, Brampton, Oshawa, Brantford, Barrie, Kingston, Ottawa, North Bay, Peterborough, and then Sudbury, Niagara, 9-10 out of the playoffs. Dan has Oshawa, Brampton, Brantford, Barrie, Kingston, Ottawa, Sudbury, Niagara, and then North Bay, 9, Peterborough, 10, missing the dance. Those are our 
Eastern Conference predictions heading into the season. I wrote it down. I'm going to keep this this piece of paper right beside my computer so that anytime we need to either chirp each other or somebody makes reference to it, oh yeah, it's right here in blue and white, plus it's on the internet. <laughs> Fair enough. And and when I uh, go on my arson spree, I'll know where to burn it. So because you told me where you left it. So, <laughs> oh, you got to love the predictions time of the season. And listen, we've got one set of predictions left, which is the Western Conference. We'll do that next week. And then we are into regular season OHL hockey. I Dan, I'm starting to feel I'm starting to feel like I'm ready for this. How about you? Very much so. And, you know, like every year. Until we get some games in and see what we really got, it, it's really hard to do this. I mean, predictions seem easy, but I think once the games get start getting played, you see who's back, you see who's gelling, you see what systems are in place for the new coaches. Anyway, the excitement's in the air. I'm with you, Mike. Uh, I just want that puck to drop. Let's face it. Predictions are for idiots, but hopefully you find these two idiots entertaining because what else are you going to do, right? We got to throw it out there and, and give you our best shot. So... We have uh, his name is Dan Mahar. Find him on Twitter or X at his name, Dan Mahar. I am Mike Farwell at Farwell underscore OHL. Please send us an email anytime. OHL podcast at rogers.com. We're still looking at you, Sue. Why have you not answered roll call yet? Leave a comment on YouTube or shoot that email or tweet us, whatever you want to do. Uh, we're here for the season ahead and your Western Conference predictions are coming up next week on the OHL podcast.